Welcome to the Weights and Measures Primer. My name is Ross Anderson. This is the first of three videos aimed to help people understand the recommendations of the Verification Scale Division E task group. In this first video, I will examine the principles of the scales code. In the second video, I will explain the specific task group recommendations. To fully understand part two, I strongly encourage you to watch part one first. The third video will explore case studies applying the scales code principles. For the record, I'm not speaking for the task group. For the position of the task group, refer to the published reports. I'm speaking as the original submitter of the item and a member of the task group. I'm also covering more than the task group recommendations. First in the discussion, I will explain important aspects of the scale code and its primary source, R76, to provide context. Second, I'm trying to reunify some of the original submission. The uh -huh. S&T committee chose to break the proposal into parts without realizing that all the parts were interconnected. They assigned some of the parts to the task group and left the remainder as developing items. I always saw the proposal as a whole, and I will clearly delineate items that are not part of the task group. It was after hearing the Cannabis Workgroup report at the 2019 annual meeting that the root cause of all the problems hit me. The proposal I submitted shortly after that meeting was a recognition that there was confusion in interpreting the scales code. This is echoed in the comments of the Office of Weights and Measures, and this confusion was present from the adoption of the code in 1984. It was the emergence of a cannabis industry that brought the confusion into focus. It's not just confusion. There are significant flaws in the code. The pre-1984 scales code, written originally for analog instruments, was woefully incapable of handling the demands of digital electronic weighing instruments. The international community had a code. We know it as R76. The international approach varied diametrically from the old code, as I shall explain. The decision was not to repair, but to repeal and replace the old code, moving mostly to the R76 approach. There were obstacles the translators had to overcome. Simply stated, R76 had to be translated into Handbook 44. The confusion stems from what got lost in translation. R76 has a different organization. Here's a comparison. You can see the complexity in translation as you must ensure that the corresponding requirements end up directed appropriately to the manufacturer or the official. R76 has no section for user requirements since it is policing the trade in instruments rather than commodities and services. Here are two fundamental examples of translation errors from the section on principles. TN12 deals with classification. It declares that classification of instruments is based on the number of scale divisions N and the scale divisions D. TN13 deals with tolerances and declares that tolerances are related to the scale division D or the verification scale division E. The problem is that the code is at odds with itself. Note the reference to D in both sections. Looking at the definitions, also adopted in 1984, we find that classification and tolerances are only tied to the verification scale division E, not to D. The definition of D contains nothing about either topic. Classifications in Table 3 are expressed in D or E, even though TN12 only refers to D. The tolerances in Table 6 are exclusively in D, even though TN13 says D or E. Finally, when we compare to the parallel sections of R76, we find classification and accuracy are expressed solely in E. The mistranslations blurred an important distinction in R76 between E and D. It changed meaning significantly in several key sections of Handbook 44. The confusion that spawns from this change in meaning is far-reaching and very significant. In R76, E is the measure of accuracy and precision, while D refers to resolution. Search the web for accuracy, precision, and resolution, and you will find numerous attempts to explain the subtle but important distinction between these terms. Accuracy is complex. 
in the singular, a measurement can be accurate that is close to the actual value. Yet for an instrument, we want it to consistently repeat that accuracy. This is precision or repeatability. If you think about it carefully, neither accuracy nor precision is dependent on the resolution. Here's a simple example. Imagine a one meter ruler with one millimeter graduation. Suppose we test this ruler at 100 random points and find it is consistently accurate to within half a millimeter at every point. Let's now remove all the millimeter graduations. We've reduced the resolution by a factor of 10. Did that reduction change the accuracy? No, the instrument remains accurate to half a millimeter at every graduation. I'll drop a hint. Accuracy is judged in the test, not in the transaction. Scales are different from any other instruments. Comparing it to a motor fuel dispenser will help. Look at the tolerances for a dispenser. The tolerances get larger at larger quantities, but increase in proportion to the quantity, accuracy to 0.5%. The performance is predicted to be linear because the sensor measures only a small quantity many times over. The weighing instrument tolerance gets larger, but this is spread over increasing quantity ranges, resulting in decreasing relative accuracy from 0.02% down to potentially 0.003%. A weight sensor must span the finite weighing range of the instrument. It is very difficult to make a perfectly linear sensor over a large range. Tolerances in R76 reflect that the performance may only be quasi-linear over the weighing range. The R76 tolerances address many sources of error. Tolerances include imprecision or noise. If the instrument gives varying results when tests are repeated, then all of the values must fall within the tolerance. We apply tolerances to both gross and net weight. This limits any curvature or erratic changes in the instrument performance. This is another developing item not included in the charge of the task group. From any net zero indication, the tolerance structure is reset to a new zero reference. More in part two. Tolerances include influence factors, where the instrument performance changes based on the environment. With these three competing sources of variability, we see that the manufacturer has to balance the impact of all three in combination. An increase in one requires a decrease in the other two. Finally, there's a fourth item. We expect the divisions of the instrument scale to be uniform in size and character. That's resolution. This is required in GS523, although rarely talked about. Uniform does not mean exact, but rather close enough. Since uncertainties make it impractical to verify individual divisions, we verify conformance of the divisions by looking over ranges of multiple uniform divisions D. Here's the picture. This is a class two scale. I'll start in the type evaluation lab, where we apply acceptance tolerance, the dotted black lines. There are two important rules in the testing. First, we adjust the instrument to zero at reference conditions, usually at three quarters of capacity. That's the green line. Second, we only change one influence at a time in our tests above and below the reference conditions. The largest single influence may be temperature where blue is cold and red is hot. R76 includes a similar graphic in the definition of error in T55. You see the smooth curves. The lines widen to represent the noise with more noise at higher loads. They are smooth because the divisions of the instrument scale are required to be uniform in size. The alternative would be a jagged performance curve, which is not permitted by GS523. But notice that the curvature means the scale divisions D are not all equal. When the error slopes plus, it is because the divisions D are slightly smaller than declared. When the error slopes minus, the Ds are slightly larger than declared. We can't test an instrument with curvature at only one point as we do with a metering device. We tested enough points to approximate these curves, 
perhaps three to five points being sufficient, with emphasis on the most stringent points where the tolerances change and at capacity. The test points are thus interconnected in the verification process. Now we move to the instrument in the field. In commerce, the rules change. First, we adjust the ambient conditions at the time of installation. This figure is a worst case where we adjusted to zero error at three quarters of capacity at the largest combined minus influences. Second, we recognize that we can't control influences, so we accept that multiple influences are combining when we test. This causes the worst case red and blue lines to fan out more from the green line at reference conditions than they do in type evaluation. Think of the red line as the largest positive influences and the blue as the largest negative influences. To observe the extremes of the performance curve might require many tests over time. One very critical thing we must understand is that errors do not invade the shaded areas under the step risers. This is because the scale divisions and increments D must be uniform in size and character. What I'm trying to convey is that table six implies a scale can have a 1E error at 1E load. GS523 says it can't, and you must comply with both at the same time. Let me show that another way. I'll graph the red, green, and blue lines from this plot using percent error on the y scale. To find percent error at any point, we compute error divided by load times 100. Here it's computed at 20,000 E. The slope of the amber triangle in this case is just under 0.01%. If we do this for the entire red, green, and blue lines, we find the following. Notice that the black lines of the tolerance do not follow the instrument performance. An error of 1E at 1E load represents 100% error. The main focus for tolerances is on the relative error, 0.02% at 5000E and 0.01% at 20000E, etc. To verify this, we test at the breakpoints. With negative curvature, as in this example, we find the lines of percent error slope negative. Because the curves cannot invade the shaded areas, the max percent error should never exceed 0.02% over the first tolerance step. For class 2, this also applies up to 10,000E, since 2E per 10,000E is also 0.02%. Relative accuracy generally tightens with increasing N. It is common to focus on the error alone and forget that we must keep the load in mind. Relative accuracy combining error and test load is what R76 is primarily interested in. A comparison can help. Here I am taking the previous graph for N equals 20,000 and comparing it to a compliant instrument with N equals 50,000. The critical difference is in the curvature. The curvature of the three curves at left is significantly more than at right. The differences become clearer when we compare relative accuracy. Both instruments were set to zero error at three quarters of capacity and at the maximum negative effect of influences. The relative error at right is 40% smaller than at left. Next, notice the slopes of the three curves. Slope in this percent error graph is indicative of curvature. At left, the slope is significantly steeper than at right. The larger the value of n, the less curvature is permitted by the tolerance structure, and the flatter these curves become. Finally, notice the spacing between the three curves. This reflects the effects of influences. At left, we're seeing more effect than at right. The point is to show that tolerances tighten with an increased n, and the manufacturer is balancing the noise, curvature, and influence factors to ensure the instrument remains within tolerance. Here I've plotted the maximum percent error curves for the R76 weight classes based on the tolerance table and uniform scale divisions. The Handbook 44 Class 3L will be addressed later. Notice how linear scales must be to meet all the tolerance requirements and how this gets more stringent with increasing values of N. Also, the percent error for the first step continues all the way down to 1E load because the divisions must be uniform. 
The next piece involves the developing item concerning error, item GEN 20.1, which was removed from the block. We express errors for scales in Handbook 44 as errors of over-registration, under-registration. Look at the first underlined section with indications being respectively greater or less than they should be. The definition explains should be using examples and under registration is when the indication is less than the true weight. What is true weight? It helps to contrast the term with similar terms. We express errors for artifacts such as weights and linear measures as in excess and in deficiency, calculated as actual quantity minus indicated quantity. The package errors in Handbook 133 also follow the same pattern, namely that the error is the actual minus the indicated. The errors of over under registration are calculated as indicated minus actual. In all three cases, computing error requires two scales of measurement, one for the artifact or instrument and one for the true quantity. Here's a way to visualize measurement errors. I will be showing the actual value on the upper scale in red and the indicated value on the lower scale in black. Notice the names for the upper scale. For handbooks 44 and 133, we find the actual value, should be, and for scales, the verification scale. In OIML, we find a host of names all addressing the true value. Most important for me is the conventional true value. This is the value produced using a specified standard and a designated test procedure. We agree by convention that the uncertainty of this conventional true value is small enough for the intended purpose. The combination of standard and test procedure as true value is accurate in both Handbook 44 and 133. Error is the difference between any indication and the corresponding conventional value on the actual quantity scale. Using the error model, we can begin to understand what causes error. When the indicated divisions are smaller than actual on average, the indicated quantity moves left relative to the actual quantity. This produces errors in deficiency or errors of over-registration. When the indicated divisions are larger than actual, the indicated quantity moves right relative to the actual quantity. This produces errors in excess or errors of under-registration. It's critical to understand the instrument divisions must be uniform in size. This is both a critical assumption as well as a specification in GS 523. I proposed renaming these two kinds of error error of delivery for excess deficiency, and error of indication for over under registration. The important thing is to measure error, you need two separate and independent scales. The two kinds of error are just two sides of the same coin. When you deliver less, you indicate more. When you deliver more, you indicate less. But there's one additional piece of the model. The tolerance. Tolerance is expressed in terms of the actual quantity. It must be, since the actual quantity is something known and the indicated quantity is an unknown variable. Regardless of how the tolerance is expressed in a code, it eventually gets implemented as scale divisions on the actual scale, hence, verification scale divisions. Here are some instruments and their tolerances. The maintenance tolerance gets applied as a number of scale divisions of actual quantity. For the motor fuel dispenser, it's six actual scale divisions. For the VTM, it's 14 divisions. For the taxi meter, it's minus five and plus 21 divisions. For the scale, it's one division. Now consider the scale divisions of the instruments. All but the scale have indicated scale divisions that are quite different from the actual scale divisions. But notice that some of the indicated divisions D are quite small relative to the tolerance, and others are quite large. 
There is something important that was lost in translation from R76. We find it in Table 2 with some help from Table 3. There are four kinds of instruments. Let's compare the scale division D to the first step tolerance in each case. First, normal resolution for those instruments without an auxiliary indicating device. I'll explain the auxiliary indicating device in detail later on. These instruments have D equal to the first tolerance step. Second, high resolution, or those with an auxiliary indicating device. These are found in class 1 and 2, and the value of D is smaller than the first step tolerance. Third, undefined resolution, or balancing instruments. These have no indicated divisions D for comparison. Fourth, low resolution, or those used for grading. We call these in the U.S. weight classifiers. The value of D is equal to or larger than the first step tolerance. Consider two high resolution, one normal resolution, and one low resolution weighing instrument in this table. The instrument resolution relative to the tolerance results in a thousand fold range from one one hundredth of the tolerance to one tenth to one times the tolerance to ten times the tolerance, or from 0 0.01 to 10 in column 3. This reaffirms the point that instrument resolution is independent of the accuracy. In the bottom two rows, how can we evaluate tolerance compliance when our error resolution is equal to or 10 times larger than the tolerance? The real issue is error resolution. It may be helpful to consider other kinds of instruments. I've added rows for motor fuel meters in gallons and liters. For these, the instrument resolution is 1 26th and 1 10th of the tolerance, or 0.04 and 0.01 in column 3. For a vehicle tank meter, it's 1 3rd of the tolerance, and for the taxi meter, it's 10 times the tolerance. I've color coded the rows either yellow or blue. For the yellow shaded rows, the error resolution is the same as the instrument resolution. For the blue shaded rows, the two resolutions are different. I derive from this that there must be two different test procedures. In the yellow rows, you resolve the errors on the instrument scale. For the blue rows, you resolve the error on the verification or actual quantity scale. More on this shortly. Most important, compare column 3 to column 5. In column 3, we find a range of 1,000. In column 5, the range is only 20, if you exclude the two rows in red. This illustrates an important rule in verification, namely that you resolve the error to at least one-fifth, 0.2, of the maintenance tolerance. I didn't just make this up. You can find the rule at work in Handbook 133. Procedures require that you resolve package errors to at least one-sixth of the package tolerance, or MAV. I made a two-part video titled, What is the Risk in Testing, that explains the statistics behind the rule. The rule is also embedded in OIML documents. Here are three sections lost in translation from R76. In the first, it establishes a requirement that you be able to reliably read an analog instrument to at least 0.2e, one-fifth of an e. This effectively limits the size relationship between the spacing of the graduations and their width. It enables you to visually interpolate between graduations if you want to when testing. Notice this comes from technical requirements in Section 4 relating to the design of the instrument. In T543, R76 defines the rounding error of digital indication in comparison to the equivalent analog indication, read to at least 0.2e. Next, R76 requires that you correct for this digital rounding error whenever the scale division D is greater than 0.2e. Notice this elimination of the rounding error applies only to testing and not in commerce. I'll plant a seed. D's are for commerce, E's are for verification. So what's this all about? It means there are two equally valid test methods. It's often easier to see with analog. 
Analog option one resolves the error to the resolution of the actual weight or standard, like the blue shaded instruments in the table. In analog option one, we apply a test weight equal to a whole number of E and add or subtract error weights to bring the index as close as possible to the indication, in this case 51. We are comparing the E's resolved to point 2E or better to a whole number of D's. When using 0.2 error weights, that is 0.6E, and when using 0.1E error weights, that is 0.7E, you compute the error using the R76 formula. Option 2 resolves the error to the resolution of the scale division D, like the yellow shaded instruments in that table. In analog option 2 with the same instrument, we apply a test weight equal to a whole number V and interpolate the indication to at least 0.2E. The human eye is very effective in interpolation. I've added boundaries in gray to show how you might read to 0.2 or 0.1D. In this case, the error is 0.4E with a resolution of 0.2E and 0.3E by 0.1E. You can also accomplish the same thing using a vernier type auxiliary indicating device. The errors match option one within the test precision of about 0.1E. Before we consider the parallel options for digital indication, I need to show another section from R76 that was lost in translation. R76 directs that we use the changeover points, we often call the breakpoints, as the reference for our test. Scales code has no equivalent in its test procedure. This is at points where the indications increment since we switch from round down to round up. In digital option one, we apply a test weight equal to a whole number V and add as needed. Instead of measuring from the zero graduation to the displayed graduation in our analog test, we calculate the amount of test weights required to move from the digital breakpoint above zero to the breakpoint above the test indication, here 50. For 0.2E resolution, this is 0.6E to the breakpoint at 0 and 0.2E for the breakpoint above 50. R76 provides a simple formula where the indication and the load are recorded before the addition of the error weights. We are finding the precise test load to move a whole number of indicated divisions D. In option two, we have an instrument with an auxiliary indicating device or an extended displaying device. The indication as shown to 0.2E is 50.4E and the actual weight is 50E. The error is plus 0.4E. The divisions D on the instrument could have been 0.1E and we would have found the same 0.3 error as in the analog cases. Notice how this option mirrors option two for analog. I hope you see these four numeric options produce the equivalent error for analog and digital instruments within the test precision of 0.1e. NTEP accepts either option. Also, option one is the only way to test a digital weight classifier because they round up. This is the proposed addition to the test notes in Handbook 44 to clarify that the error has to be resolved to at least 0.2e parallel to R76. It addresses both analog and digital as just explained to assure equivalency. I'll explain the class 3L in part three. The resolution of error is not just a scales code issue. I might suggest it ought to be addressed more generally. This proposed section GN3 creates a one-fifth rule for the resolution of the error in the general code to go with the one-third rule regarding the accuracy of the standard. It specifies that the errors in testing be resolved to at least one-fifth of the maintenance tolerance. Note the one-fifth rule is relative to maintenance tolerance, while the one-third rule is relative to acceptance tolerance. It could also go in the fundamental considerations. This concludes the background material necessary to understand the changes proposed by the task group. There's a lot here to digest. In summary, one, 
the translators did a pretty good job converting R76 to Handbook 44. It took over 35 years for us to recognize the subtle problems caused by translation errors. 2. E is declared by the manufacturer. E and N are used to specify the accuracy and precision. We verify the relative error of the indicated Ds using the actual test loads in E's. We use E since some instruments have no Ds, and for other instruments, D is out of proportion to the tolerances, either smaller or larger. We must unlearn that there is a connection between E and D. They are independent of each other. We must unlearn the idea that E is found on the instrument scale. It's on the actual scale. Three, the tolerance structure limits the relative error using E and N. The manufacturer must balance the effects of imprecision, nonlinearity, and influences to ensure the instrument indications stay within tolerance. Also, D must be uniform, resulting in a performance curve that is smooth and continuous. Four, the test procedure must resolve errors to at least 0.2E to work with the numeric model. If you resolve the error to 1E, the usual field practice, Rounding increases the tolerance in the first step by 50% and in the second by 25%. Do that with full understanding of the impact of risks to buyer and seller. For more on this, see my video titled, What are the Risks in Testing? And five, E is a tool only for testing, not the object of the test. Test loads and tolerances in R76 Table 6 are in E's. The tests verify the accuracy and consistency of the D's. Once the instrument is verified as compliant, the weight indication of the instrument in D's is used in commerce. This brings my discussion of fundamentals in Part 1 to a close. Please come back for Part 2 where I discuss the task group recommendations, and part three, where I'll discuss two case studies applying the principles of the scales code. Thank you for watching.